You're listening to Release Your Resistance with Bex Beltran, episode 120. Welcome to Release Your Resistance. This is Bex. The only reason why any of us don't have what we want in life is because of our own resistance. Right now, I'm learning how to recognize and release my resistance, and this podcast tells you how you can release your resistance so that you can live the exact life that you want. Let's get started. Why do you think what you think? Where did your preferences and life positions come from? Many of our present-day opinions, attitudes, and beliefs were initially formed when we were children. Something is good or bad, wanted or unwanted, acceptable or shameful. We have also been practicing opinions, attitudes, and beliefs about ourselves since the age we created them. So we might be thinking about parts of ourselves as good or bad, wanted or unwanted, and acceptable or shameful. Along the way, we have changed our minds about so many opinions because of education, experience, a broader perspective, and maturity. But there are probably still so many ideas that we keep assuming, thinking, and believing exactly the same way we did as when we were a child using our child's mind's logic and reasoning, or lack thereof. Today, let's try to look at ideas with our current adult mature perspectives. We can notice any attitudes and beliefs that we formed as children and explore them now with fresh eyes and a new understanding. I heard an example recently, and it illustrates this so perfectly, and I am changing some of the details for anonymity to share it with you. I was talking with a woman who told me about a shameful memory from when she was seven years old. She is still clinging to what she said and how she was ridiculed and what the outcome of that situation was from over 30 years ago. She shared the incident with me as if it was relevant context for what is happening today in her life. Her brain thinks it is very relevant. Her brain thinks that What that little child said somehow indicates what kind of a person she is today as an adult. But if we look at the situation now, zoomed out as adults, we can see that, yes, it makes sense that a seven-year-old would say what she said in that situation. She wouldn't have understood the impact and the inappropriateness. The adult woman does not need to be embarrassed now for what a seven-year-old said. She doesn't need to carry it with her and make it part of her identity. That embarrassing yet innocent little comment out of a child's mind does not have to be the reason that she is the way she is today. She can let that long-held belief go. Another way we can explore and adjust our long-held beliefs is by choosing to love unconditionally. What does unconditional love mean? It means, literally, to love without any conditions. You may have believed you could not or should not love so freely and so non-judgmentally. Let's drop that long-held belief if it is creating a need to control. You can love yourself, your situation, your people, everything and everyone without putting any rules or manuals or expectations on what or how or why you love. You can give your love completely freely with no price of admission and no limit. Why not? What is the downside to loving unconditionally? I can already hear all the cautions and reasons and examples of why this is a terrible idea and how there is, in fact, a very dangerous downside. I even found a thread on social media this past week where people took the time to spell out all the downsides. 
Many of the comments centered around the idea of loving someone who is hurting you, or not respecting boundaries, or disrespecting you. And I think the disagreement here is confusing the verb to love with the verb to stay, or to condone, or to approve of. I don't think anyone should stay in a situation that is unsafe or harmful. I don't think we should drop our own boundaries in the name of love. So let's agree on some very general definitions about what it means to love. I am talking about this in very broad terms. To love someone is to have affection for someone. And affection can mean care. So my own personal definition is that loving at the most basic, least intimate level means wishing someone well. So if I have the choice to wish someone well or send someone good vibes versus wishing them harm or sending them bad luck, I am probably the person most impacted by my choice. The other person may not even be aware but I will feel the energy of my own wishes for them. If someone is in a difficult relationship with another person, they have the choice to love or not love. And whatever other verbs you want to include in the choices, like fear, hate, despise. So if you have the choice to love someone or to hate someone, You do get more peace and less stress by choosing to love or wish them well or send them good vibes instead of choosing to hate. You might not even think you are choosing hate. That might just be a long-held, pre-programmed belief from childhood or somewhere else. But now that you hear that you don't have to hate, you don't have to wish someone harm, would you consider loving unconditionally? Remember, we can do two things at once. We can love someone while not living with them or seeing them. We can love someone while also believing that actions should and do have consequences. What is the upside to measuring and withholding your love in certain cases or with certain people or when your certain conditions have not been met? Maybe it does sound smart to hold back or only love if, but in practice, maybe we think that the quote-unquote problem with unconditional love is that people do things that we don't love. So what are we supposed to do? Accept what they do? Are we supposed to love them when they disappoint us? Well, what's the alternative? Should we hate them when they disappoint us? Should we dislike them when they don't behave? the way we think they should? Those are all options, and they might be what we have been believing we should do most of our lives. I just really do not see the benefit. There is no upside to hating or disliking. It does not feel good. It is coming from a place of fear instead of from a place of love. Hating, disliking, and withholding puts you in a scarcity instead of abundance mindset. It also probably does not work if you are using your withholding as a way to change someone else's thoughts or behavior. If the reason why you think you cannot love unconditionally is because of someone's actions, will withholding your love cause them to act in the way you prefer? Unlikely. We can just decide to believe every human is 100% worthy of being loved. Even humans who have made mistakes, or humans who have hurt us, or even people who have been found guilty in criminal proceedings. When we choose to love unconditionally, we are more likely to be open to forgiving, supporting, and accepting others. What about how we love ourselves? Do you choose to love yourself unconditionally, to forgive and support and accept yourself? Do you believe you are 100% worthy of being loved by others and by yourself? I once heard a podcast interview where the guest suggested that instead of thinking about activities as self-care, we could think of them as self-worth activities. 
I don't remember her exact reasoning behind this word shift, but I like the vibe of it. When I think of self-care, sometimes it can feel a little indulgent or a little bit like I'm just doing something nice. It almost feels like an obligation or because I quote unquote should or have to. But when I think of doing something for myself from the perspective of self-worth, it is more confirming that I am worthy of this time or energy or activity or expense. What about you? Can you think of some things that might be classified as quote-unquote self-care that you do not do because they do feel a little too indulgent, but when you reframe them as self-worth, Does it feel more aligning? As we are talking about our long-held beliefs, let's also start to notice our own emotional patterns. Notice how and why you react to people and circumstances. If your reactions are grounded in attitudes and beliefs from your childhood, consider reprogramming some of those old emotional patterns. For example, if you notice yourself shifting into people-pleasing mode when someone's mood seems to tilt towards anger or disappointment, you can check in to see if now, as an adult, when you know that people are responsible for their own feelings, maybe you prefer not to people-please and just let the other person experience whatever emotions they are experiencing. Another example might be if you go into defensive mode and attack in a strike first way when you feel challenged. You can slow down and consider if what seems like a challenge to you is actually a threat and if you really want to strike, attack, or defend. Or would you rather respond in a more mature, confident way? You can think about it as if it were emotional time travel. The emotional time travel is possible when you can go back to whatever hurt you or scared you or diminished you as a child, and with your adult mind, you can reframe that experience for yourself with unconditional love and acceptance as your current adult self. Have you ever heard someone explain their behavior or their tendencies with, well, that's just how I am wired? Good news! Neuroscientists tell us that we, as a species, are wired for kindness and generosity. So this emotional reprogramming should come naturally once you start considering it. Humans are also wired to connect with others. Let's consider connection in the context of unconditional love. I'm suggesting when we love conditionally instead of unconditionally and instead of connecting, we could say we are disconnecting. It's interesting to point out that humans want to love. So to do the opposite is counter to how we have evolved and how we are wired. Reconnect or connect for the first time to compassion, forgiveness, and generosity for yourself and others. You are 100% worthy of it, and so are they. There are so many ways you can examine and process all these ideas. Obviously, since I have been promoting the Let Go and Surrender journal for the past month, I am going to suggest journaling as a tool for self-reflection. You can also think about mindfulness, like meditation. One specific type of meditation you can try is called loving-kindness meditation. It's also known as meta-meditation. That's M-E-T-T-A. It's when you send goodwill, kindness, and warmth towards others by silently repeating a series of positive, reassuring phrases. Wish others true happiness, joy, and fulfillment. Another way to reprogram your emotional patterns is to repeat a positive affirmation to yourself. For example, here is this week's verse to practice surrender. Let me remember to be open and gentle with myself and others. My needs and desires are met in amazing ways. I know how to have love, compassion, and peace. I can connect with others, and myself. Let life be joyful. Let me forgive always. Let me surrender. 
Where are we on Maslow's hierarchy now that we're in the second half of this eight-week series? We have moved up to the love and belonging level of the pyramid. This level is about interpersonal relationships and being a member of a community. We can also now focus on the heart chakra, which is about connection. This is the center of compassion, forgiveness, and generosity. Here are some journal prompts for this week. Why do I or don't I allow others to give to me? Why am I worthy to receive? Can I get to the root of any unworthy beliefs about myself so I can reprogram them? We have covered so many big topics today, and I have sent you back to your childhood. I have encouraged you to love unconditionally. You might be thinking about how you can reprogram your emotional patterns right now. So I am curious about how you are reacting to all of these concepts. Share your reaction with me by sending me an email at hi at bexby.org or leave a comment at the show notes for this episode at bexby.org slash longheld. That's L-O-N-G-H-E-L-D. If you want to discuss these topics with me and other people in real time, join me in about two weeks on Tuesday, February 21st, 2023 for a hybrid workshop and discussion. We will talk all about abundance versus scarcity and many of the topics that we mentioned today. If you join via Zoom, it is audio only, so you don't even need to have your camera on. And if you join us in the physical room, space is limited, so please make sure to RSVP early and get the Zoom details at bexpeed.org slash let's meet. Next week, in week six, we will be talking about opening yourself to possibilities. This is getting very exciting. Can you feel it? Thank you so much for listening this week. I will talk with you again soon. You know what I'm really good at? Asking questions, then listening to the answer, and redirecting you if you didn't answer then showing you your thoughts from how you answered. That is part of what coaching with me is like. I don't have an agenda for you. I don't think I know better than you. I do believe in you and your capacity. If you tell me what you want for yourself, I believe it. I can see it for you. I can show you the thoughts that are keeping you from getting what you want. Then you can drop those thoughts and go get what you want coaching really works. Come to my site at bexby.org slash coaching and book a session with me. This has been Release Your Resistance. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, make sure you're subscribed and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Also, think about someone who you know who would love this episode and share it with them. There should be a share button on your app if you're listening to this on your phone. If you'd like to continue this conversation one-on-one or in real time, come visit me on my site at bexbead.org to see how we can work together. 